My name is Josh and I'm a research and development engineer with Advanced Cooling Technologies in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Today I want to discuss our work on developing a two-phase loop thermosiphon for solar-driven desalination. Although solar energy is intermittent and that poses a challenge, it's attractive as a method for providing heat to desalination, since the fresh water can be easily stored and thus the intermittent source isn't an issue. The heat that's produced can be used either for direct desalination of brine or as a heat source for reverse osmosis membrane. Here we have a typically commercially available method for supplying heat to a desalination system and that would be a parabolic trough solar collector. Incident solar rays are reflected off the trough and converge on the vacuum insulated receiver where they're absorbed as heat on the inner steel tube of the receiver. As this tube heats up, the thermal energy is transferred to the liquid working fluid, which is typically a high temperature oil. And then the heated oil is pumped to a heat exchanger where it can be either used to directly boil the brine or heat an upstream flow for a reverse osmosis process. Although this state-of-the-art system is quite efficient, we believe that we can improve on it in a few key areas. First, we decided to replace the steel receiver tube with a glass receiver tube. This change allows the incident solar rays to pass directly through the tube and into the working fluid, which eliminates conductive and convective thermal resistances through the receiver wall. However, for this change to work, the working fluid must be tailored to absorb nearly 100% of the incident solar radiation. In other words, we have to use a dark working fluid. A large part of our project has been life testing various working fluids to ensure that they have excellent absorptivity across the entire solar spectrum and that they don't lose this performance over time. While this work isn't the focus of this presentation, we have made good progress on these fluids and our modeling suggests that the new solar receiver with the volumetric absorption fluid will improve the overall solar to thermal efficiency by about 2% on an absolute basis. A more significant change to the system is that our system does not require a pump, and this is accomplished by allowing the water-based working fluid to boil in the receiver. The working fluid leaves the receiver with between 50 and 70% vapor on a volumetric basis, or a 50 to 70% void fraction. This two-phase working fluid rises to the heat exchanger where it condenses, and after condensing, the liquid returns to the receiver by gravity. This looping, gravity-driven flow is a classic loop thermosiphon design. A loop thermosiphon operates like a traditional thermosiphon where a two-phase working fluid is transferred from an evaporator to a condenser by taking advantage of the density difference between the liquid and vapor phases. However, unlike a traditional single tube thermosiphon, the liquid and vapor phases do not flow in the same tube. Rather, the vapor and liquid tubes create a loop giving this thermosiphon its name. So today I'm going to discuss our design process for the solar-driven loop thermosiphon, the model that I developed to predict its performance, and then some comparisons between these model results and our lab scale prototype. I won't be directly focusing on the solar part of the system, but the passive nature of the loop thermosiphon makes these devices really well suited to lots of solar thermal applications. So perhaps this presentation will make you think of some other applications where similar loop thermosiphons would be useful. When designing a loop thermosiphon, the most important consideration is the pressure balance around the loop. Without a pump, the fluid flow is entirely driven by gravity, and more specifically by the liquid head in the liquid return line beneath the condenser. As heat is added to the evaporator, the working fluid begins to evaporate, which decreases the average fluid density in the riser. In other words, a two-phase flow leaving the evaporator will have a reduced head relative to the fully liquid flow entering the evaporator. And this head mismatch is responsible for pushing the two-phase flow against gravity. In addition to overcoming the gravity head in the riser, the liquid head must also overcome all of the frictional pressure drops around the loop. If these frictional pressure drops are too large, either the tube diameter should be increased or the condenser height must be raised to increase the liquid head. The important thing to remember here is that when the system is operating at steady state, the sum of the liquid and vapor gravitational head and frictional pressure drops must be equal to zero. The model we developed relies on this pressure drop balance to calculate the steady state mass flow rate and heat transfer characteristics. To accomplish this, first the loop was divided into discrete sections with the enthalpy and pressure being used to fully define the fluid properties within each section. Other properties such as temperature and the quality were calculated using these enthalpy and pressure values. The code begins execution at a specified section, and after it completes the pressure drop and heat transfer calculations on that section, it writes the calculated exit enthalpy and exit pressure to the inlet of the downstream section. This process will continue around the loop until the calculated pressure and enthalpy values agree 
doing subsequent loops. For the regions with 100% liquid or vapor flow, standard Darcy friction factor equations are used for the tubular flow frictional pressure drop. However, in the two-phase flow regimes, the pressure drop calculations are a bit more difficult, and so we had to use some empirical calculations. Lockhart and Martinelli introduced what is probably the most widely used correlation, and this correlation adjusts the vapor phase pressure drop by a flow-dependent correction factor to arrive at the two-phase frictional pressure drop. The correction factor is calculated using a flow-dependent C parameter and another parameter known as a Lockhart-Martinelli parameter. The Lockhart-Martinelli parameter is the square of the ratio between the pressure drop of the liquid portion of the flow and that of the vapor portion of the flow. I won't get into all the details of this method here, but it's really well documented in the literature. Heat losses from the system were estimated using a collection of single and two-phase correlations. In the evaporator, the Candlicker boiling flow correlation was used to calculate the two-phase heat transfer coefficient. Chen has a correlation that's used in the two-phase riser, and then Shaw's condensing flow correlation was used in the condenser. For the single-phase liquid, the Nolinsky or ditas bolter nusselt number correlations are used depending on the flow regime. Tube and insulation material and thickness are user selectable in the code, and then the code uses these numbers to form a resistance network to estimate convective losses to the environment. So let's take a look at some of the modeling results that we've generated and what this tells us about loop thermosiphon operation. This is a scaled down version of our solar driven loop thermosiphon. The evaporator is about half a meter long. The water cooled condenser is approximately 0.3 meters above the evaporator. And we have saturation temperatures of 100, 110, and 120 with the heat input varying between about 200 and 900 watts. Here we see the modeled mass flow rate plotted against power at the three temperatures. Looking at the curve for 100C, we see that the flow rate rises at powers less than about 300 watts before falling to a nearly steady value above 500 watts. The curves for 110 and 120 are similar, but the maximum flow rate peak shifts to the right as temperature is increased. So why do we see this increase in flow rate followed by a decrease at a higher power. The answer lies in changes in pressure drop around the loop. To illustrate this, let's look at the liquid gravitational head versus power for the 120 degrees Celsius case. Since the total system pressure must be balanced, we know that there must be negative pressure drops balancing out this liquid head. The first of these pressure drops is the frictional pressure drop in the two-phase flow between the evaporator and the condenser. At 200 watts, the void fraction within the two-phase flow is low, which results in a low two-phase frictional pressure drop. As power is increased to 300, and 400 watts, the void fraction increases and so does the frictional pressure drop. The second frictional pressure drop is in the liquid portion of the loop. As expected, this is a very small contributor. And finally, we have the gravitational head of the two-phase flow. At 200 watts, this two-phase head is significant, but the void fraction increases quickly between 200 and 400 watts and the density of this two-phase working fluid and the resulting gravitational head rapidly decreases. The shift in dominant pressure drop between 300 and 400 watts is responsible for the initial increase in flow rate, followed by the steady decrease in flow rate. At lower powers, the two-phase head decreases faster than the two-phase frictional pressure drop increases, and this increases the flow rate. However, as the power increases past about 400 watts, the two-phase head decreases more slowly than the now rapidly increasing two-phase frictional pressure drop. Because of this, the flow rate begins to fall. The model was used to design the lab-scale loop thermosiphon, which was constructed, instrumented, and filled with water as a working fluid. This loop was heated by cartridge heaters and cooled by chilled water. We used some RTDs for temperature measurements, an absolute pressure transducer for a pressure measurement, and an electromagnetic flow meter to record the flow rate. The system was operated at three fluid charges of 650, 750, and 850 milliliters. And as in the model, the loop was maintained at 100, 110, and 120 Celsius, while the evaporator power was varied between 500 and 1000 watts. Here we see the experimental mass flow rate versus power for the three fluid charges. A higher charge corresponds to an increase in the liquid head, which as we expect, lead to an increase in the mass flow rate. This data was compared against similar model results with the model being shown to predict the mass flow rate to within about 20% of the experimental value. While 20% is significant, it's well within the typical predicted ability of the two-phase frictional pressure drop correlations that we use. And importantly, the model was shown to be capable of predicting the trend of increasing mass flow rate with increasing charge. This initial work demonstrated that the model is capable of predicting the mass flow rate for a two-phase loop thermosiphon. However, we would like to more closely examine the predicted pressure drops and saturation temperature changes around the entire loop. For this reason, we're currently building a larger loop with more complete instrumentation, and this will allow us to fine-tune the prediction capabilities of our model. This model has been designed to be extremely flexible, 
and adaptable to many different loop thermosiphon configurations. And so if you have an application that you think could be improved by a loop thermosiphon, we would really love to discuss the application with you. This project was funded by the Solar Energy Technology Office, and I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, Nathan Van Belsen, Jen Jen Wong, and Sean Hoenig.